All right, everyone. Thank you for attending our webinar today. My name is Brian Horn. I'm editor of Lawn and Landscape. Um, thanks for joining us. The webinar is entitled Cutting Edge Nutrient Technology Doesn't Have to Cost More, sponsored by Foliar Pack. Uh, a couple of things before we get to the presentation. We'll be sending out a link of this webinar um, to everyone who registered. So if you're, you know, if you couldn't make it or you have to leave early, we'll be sending that out uh, probably next week, and it'll be housed on LawnAndLandscape.com. The second thing is that if you have a computer screen in front of you, you'll have a GoToWebinar uh, software up. You can ask us questions uh, when you want to. Just find the questions tab on your screen, type those in, send them along to me, and I'll be collecting them and we'll be asking those at the end of the webinar. Um, the main presenter today is George Murray. He is president of ENP. Foliar Pack's Foliar Pack products are made by ENP at a dedicated facility in Mendota, Illinois. ENP is a privately held entity dedicated to inventing, synthesizing, and formulating specialty plant fertilizers that maximize the genetic potential of plants while, re while reducing chemical inputs. Uh, George will be, as I said, George will be the main presenter and he'll be turning it over to a couple other special guest panelists as we go. So with that, George, I will turn it over to you. Hey, yeah. Thanks for that introduction there. And I uh, appreciate everyone getting on the call here. Um, during lunch, or it could be earlier than lunch, depending on where you're calling in. Certainly appreciate it. A um, little bit of housekeeping before we get rolling here, and you know we've got a, a long way to go and a short time to get there. So hopefully we can fit everything in. Um, our director of marketing is in the uh, in the room here with us, and um, I'd be I'd be remiss if I didn't have this slide up that talks about um, our social media. So certainly we've got a new website out. That's uh, super exciting for us. Um, all the video that you see there when you go to the website was shot by uh, drones that we have. Um, we're really excited about it, so certainly feel free to go there. Also, um, we've got Facebook, uh, and, and um, I think they call it Instagram. I'm a little rusty on that one, but definitely Twitter. We have a really exciting Twitter account, and uh, I know our director of marketing would love to get some more followers there, as would I. So if you want to engage with us there, feel free to. Um, getting on with the presenting, though, there's a, uh, there's a presenting team today, and I'm going to try to keep it um, pretty well sorted for you guys so we can make some sense of what we're doing here. And it's really divided into three categories today in sports turf, landscape turf, and ornamentals. And we'll, we'll continue that theme throughout the presentation, so it's a little easier to follow. I'll be doing most of the talking, but I've got um, Greg Pavlosic here with us, territory rep for Advanced Turf Solutions in Chicago. Uh, he was uh, a big help uh, with a lot of the trials that you, that you uh, are going to see today. And not all of them, certainly, but um, he's been a, a big help there. So he's going to have a lot of really nice insight, and he'll kind of help me uh, as we move from here. Uh, then we're going to get into Christy Solberg uh, with uh, Park Ridge Parks Department, uh, the Parks Maintenance Manager there, and Brian Hissom. Uh, they work together there in Chicago, and you'll see that on our first uh, case study. Uh, in our second case study, we're going to get with Jeff Brooks and Dave Waller of Waller Landscaping over there in Pittsburgh to talk about landscape turf. And uh, I know Dave sent in his picture. I just got a little bit late there. So he's a great guy, but um, I was only able to get his, uh, his logo up for right now. But um, they'll be talking in case uh, number two. And then the case study number three is Ken Tomiko with Tomiko Arbor Services over there in Jeanette, Pennsylvania, and, uh, and Todd Smith. So we've got a great, great team here. Um, I'll be doing a majority of the talking, but uh, in order to keep things interesting, I'm going to have uh, these other fine folks weighing in as well. So. Um, Moving on, so overview, just so uh, we can keep track of what we're doing here. Um, you know, why do we need technology? I think that's the first, the first question that I think anybody sitting around is probably asking. You know, George, uh, why do we need you know something that goes beyond just the standard stuff we've always done? And I'm going to hopefully talk about soil health issues, environmental stressors, and things that we can't overcome on our own uh, that will allow us to um, to see that. You know, if you've got problem fields, if you've got problem properties, if you've got ornamental plants that just won't kick in, you know, we're going to maybe talk about some reasons why, and then uh, hopefully the technologies and the pictures and the case studies are able to kind of share our story about what we've done, um, you know, across the country and helping folks reach their goals. Um, so then the case studies kick in. Certainly, uh, the first one we'll have is Park, uh, Park District there, Sports Turf. The second one's going to be World of Landscaping there with Landscape Turf, and the third one's going to be Arbor Services. Uh, and talk about landscape ornamentals there. So, really exciting stuff. Um, getting to it, though, we've got to sit through a little bit of science. So, I'm going to ask everyone to bear with me. I always try to keep this pretty interesting, but um, 
it would get deep at times, but we'll we'll shift gears out of that science. We're going to look at a lot of pictures on the back end. I promise. So soil health, how do we measure it? What are the implications? And I read an article a few years back, and it talked about the quantitative factors of soil health. I know that when we look around at soil, we take soil tests and we we quantify certainly the soil characteristics and the nutritional levels, but you know, a lot of what we look at when we talk about soil, whether it's healthy or not, we, we often attribute um, uh, qualitative variables to it, as in it looks good, it doesn't look good. And so really, for me, I think it's important to be able to measure things. So I'd like to show this slide that talks about measuring ways that we can look at whether the soil is healthy or not. So the first one is water-stable aggregates. And what do I mean by that? I mean your, your percentage of soil there that is water insoluble. That means if you have a lot of rain, that your soil structure is going to remain. And I think there's a lot of people online today that have problems with this. And you can think back to properties and you can think of ones that you've seen after rain and the soil ends up setting up like concrete. And that's because you don't have a lot of water stable aggregates in those soils. And most of our soils don't. If you think of professional ornamental growers, nursery growers, things like that, they choose things like bark and peat moss and sand and all those elements because they're water insoluble and they maintain their structure. So that's the first thing I think we're fighting against. Uh, the second thing we're fighting against is soil moisture potential. Uh, and what do I mean by this? We want our soil to be able to hold water, but not too much, right? So in some areas, I think we probably have people growing in sandy soils, but in a lot of areas, I think most of our soils are clay-based, so they end up holding too much water and we don't get enough oxygen to the roots. And I think uh, most people that are, are dialing in today are probably fighting the latter, where you've got a lot of clay in your soil, your drainage might be poor, your structure is poor, right? Uh, the third one is surface hardness. Um, if you have areas like athletic fields or like fields that, um, that take a lot of foot traffic, you know, maybe there's a, a concert, a musical concert that's on there, right? Um, you know, you think about the pounds per square inch and the pressure that, that human beings put underneath their feet. Um, at 150 pounds per square inch, and you can measure this with a penetrometer, but folks that uh, are listening today are going to know this to be true. At 150 pounds per square inch, uh, you have about 70% of your root growth. At uh, 200 psi, you have about 30% root growth, and at 300 psi, roots can no longer penetrate the soil. So we're dealing with surface hardness, and we do things like aeration, we do other types of cultural practices to try to help these out, but these are still things that we're fighting against when it comes to, to try and put together healthy soil. Fourth parameter, soil organic matter, right? Too much or too little, and I, you know, three and a half percent, I don't know if that's always going to work no matter where you are, but something that is true is this. If you're taking soil tests from one year to the next, you should track soil organic matter. If you have a big increase in a year and you don't know exactly where it's coming from, uh, it could be a nitrogen program issue where you're getting a lot of thatch building up too. So this is some um, this is something that you know, we need to watch and look out for. Uh, active carbon. So you're, if your soil organic matter is your long-term carbon, your active carbon is your short-term. These are the microbiological organisms that are dying off. This is the available carbon to your current microbial load, and you can test this. It's about a thirty-dollar addition to your soil test, and you can see kind of what your microbial life is in your soil. Fourth one, or rather sixth one here, is now is your, your mineral balance. Um, you know, mineral balance is important. Certainly, you know, we think of roots and we think of them like um, PVC pipes that just take up as many nutrients as they can, and that's not true. There are specific uptake sites for specific minerals and roots. And so if you have a mineral imbalance, let's say you have too much iron in the soil and not enough manganese, you can actually uh, create a mineral and manganese imbalance within the plant that way. So it's always important to take your soil tests and to look at your mineral balance. And the last one here is pH. You know, we're in this fairy tale land. We want our pH to be six and between six and six and a half. And why is that? And it's this slide here shows you this is your sweet spot. That if you get less than six, you start having metal toxicities, where metal gets in the plants too easily and you have too much of it. And you get a little higher than that, you start having these metal deficiencies where not enough can get into that. And there's there's reasons why uh, that we can certainly explain later. It's probably not a topic for today, but but this is kind of those are our goals, and so if you look around um, at this slide here, and you look at all these parameters of healthy soil, uh, I think there's a lot of people sitting in the audience today that can understand and say, yeah, a lot of properties that I maintain uh, do not have these parameters. Uh, I'm really fighting against a lot of things, and um, a lot of these things we can't fix. 
So this is kind of where we look at technology. Um, in addition to this, uh, we have issues, uh, and here's some of the mineral issues that we see in the soil where these minerals start to come together, where calcium comes together with sulfate and to form calcium sulfate or magnesium phosphate. These are insoluble. These minerals have to be in solution to be taken up into the plant. And so you have all these interactions going in the soil. You have all these factors working against you uh, that's going to that's gonna, uh, create these, these issues about nutrients getting in, about your plant roots being able to grow, about your turf and your plants being able to survive and grow in general. In addition to, well, so your implications here, before getting ahead of myself, is that your root growth, your root development leads to growth, okay, which is going to lead your water and nutrient acquisition, which is going to lead your overall plant health. It, it all starts in the soil. If you can't get good root growth because of those parameters you're fighting against, you're not going to acquire nutrients and water, and you're not going to have overall plant health. It's just not going to happen. In addition to this, with the environmental stressors, and these are the abiotic issues, which are the non-living, as opposed to the living, which are going to be your insects, your fungi, things along those lines. Uh, and this is a picture of, of a cell, of a plant cell. You have your cold and hot temps. You have your water issues, either too much or too little. We certainly experienced both of those uh, in the Midwest this year. Uh, you have your salts, and I just mean sodium chloride there, I mean any soluble salts. Um, and you have your UV radiation. And really when you come right down to it, plants are 80% water. So a lot of what we're going to be talking today is that how can we scientifically put products out there that when they're applied to ornamentals, when they're applied to turf, can make sure that your water is, main, is, is remaining in a cell and you have trigger pressure. And, and the key to it is this blue thing right here. And this is a vacuole. And the vacuole can take anywhere from up to 30% of the cell all the way up to 90% of the cell. And this is the guy that fills up with water that pushes everything against the cell wall that gives you turgor pressure. This is what allows your cells to maintain pressure and allows your plant to remain upright and not wilt. There are good salts that are loaded in the vacuole. And through the principle of osmosis, where water wants to lead from a concentration of low salts to a concentration of high salts, water loads up into there. This is, you know, if you, if you really want to get it simplistic, you know, we're fighting a cold war between the good salts that are in the cell and the bad salts that are outside the cell in your soil. And what happens is when you dry down and you start getting into this and you fertilize, you've done all these things, or, or you've naturally got soluble salts in the soil that is, your salt level becomes higher outside of your cell and your water begins to leave the cell and enter into the soil. That's when you have your wilting and that's when you have cell death. So if we can get in front of that and apply technologies that are going to predictably allow you to load up the good salts in that vacuole and keep the water in your cells, that's a big part of it right there. So we'll talk a little bit about the products today, um, but uh, just wanted to kind of work in this science before we went there. So case studies, in-depth discussions with industry experts. You guys have sat through a little bit of me talking right now. Uh, we've got just about 45 minutes. so. Um, to help when we go through these case studies, I put together these little circles. You'll see these circles. Uh, each one of the products has its own kind of circle. So Foliar Pack Grow In is GR. Foliar Pack Micro Sync is, uh, is M there. Foliar Pack Arm and Concentrate is A. PB1 LCO is PB. Four versus CL. And Bio 1266 is, is B. And so now you'll be able to track, uh, as we go through and talk about these case studies, and track which products these these individual uh, case studies we're using, and, and uh, you can be able to track it that way. So we'll talk about six products today. Um, we won't talk about them all at once, uh, but we'll, uh, we will be talking uh, about some of them at some times. So moving on here. OK, sports turf. And this picture is actually a picture of one of our customers, not one that's on the call today. But um, this was a problem field that he had. And um, he had turned to Foliar Pack Grow In uh, to be able to help him turn the field around. And you can see uh, kind of the results in the back end. Um, so Foliar Pack Grow In, we're going to be talking about that uh, with Christy and with Brian Hissom here talking about our, our case study. It's got an 845 analysis. It's got a full micronutrient package. There's humic acids, seaweeds, uh, specific amino acids in there that, again, are going to load up in those vacuoles like we talked about. There's a specific species of biology in there as well. So they're helping with nutrient uptake and polysaccharide production in soil, helping the roots grow into the soil there. Uh, there's the armament technology, which is our, our polymer uh, technology that helps with uh, nutrient uptake. And you know, our suggestion is 9 to 12 ounces uh, per 1,000 uh, every couple of weeks. Um, depends on how, how you need it. 
Uh, some folks use it once a week if they're growing in stuff, but you're talking about seeding, if you're doing hydro seeding, if you're doing sodding, if you want to improve density of established turf, or if you just have these areas that just won't get going. I have, I have folks come to me and they say, you know, George, it's just, I can't seem to get X property going. I don't know uh, what to do. Foliar pack growing is often the tool that allows folks to do that. So you'll notice here that we're not talking about kind of single analysis tools. Um, I'm not trying to trying to put us in and, and be a supplier in that regard. Um, I always tell people that we're in a business to solve problems. We just choose fertilizer as the medium to do that. So a lot of this is a lot of science, a lot of patent pending technologies that are wrapped up into single products that are going to be tools that allow you to reach your goals. So with that being said, um, we're going to move on to Christy and now Brian Hissom. Uh, you guys want to say hello? Make sure you guys are phones are working. Hello. hello. Oh, good deal. Okay, so guys, you know, I came into this thanks to Brian, and I want to give a little bit of background to the site. Um, and then, Christy, I kind of want you to, when I pop up, you know, when you came in, I kind of want you to tell the story too. But uh, Park Ridge Park District, uh, Christy, if you want to explain a little bit about Park Ridge, where it's located. Sure, we're just outside of Chicago, uh, just a little northeast of O'Hare Airport. Perfect, perfect, okay. And they acquired Prospect Park in 2013. Correct. And what can you tell me about the history of that site? Uh, so previous to us acquiring the property, it was a youth campus. It had several buildings that during the renovation process we took down and of my luck was where those buildings are is where the athletic field currently is now. So you can imagine the wear and tear from all of the construction and the heavy machinery. And then um, the project ended up having a lot more costs that we didn't originally plan into the process. So we had some spoils that we had no cost to get rid of. So they ended up putting that on top of the athletic field. Um, right. So when I came in in November of 2015, this was all already done. The only thing that wasn't done at the park was the seeding. So the conditions of the park were something that I was just handed. Right. Yeah. Much like a lot of other people that are that are dialing in. I mean, you were you were given a situation you didn't have a lot of control over. So all those nice parameters that we talked about, healthy soil. I would say that your soil probably had none of those. Correct. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, like said, the athletic field was installed over the construction debris, and it was covered with a modest level of topsoil. What do you, well, I mean, how many inches did they give you there? Mm, I, at the beginning, I thought it was a lot more, but working through the process, I would say maybe we had two inches of topsoil, if wow. that, in some areas. Right. So they said, um, hey. Here's, here's an awesome athletic field for you. We just put some awesome topsoil on it. Go to it. And it opened in May of 2016, right? So you came in November 2015, and then, you know, you're opening the following spring, right? Yeah, it was more of like a soft opening where the buildings opened and we have a splash pad and a playground. Uh, sure. We didn't play on the athletic field because uh, conditions weren't weren't ready for that until this year, but right. they, they seeded in May of 2016. So they seeded in May of 2016, and, you know, you had tried a lot of things. I mean, um, you were certainly looking at every avenue to try to get this to grow in as, as well as you can. And I think I have a picture coming up here. Let's go to this next slide. This is what it looked like in June 13th of 2017. So now we're now we're a year into this this guy, right? Yep. And you know, you had pretty much thrown everything that you could at it. So how did you know, and Brian, maybe you can tell a little bit of the story. How did how did Brian come your way or how did you find Brian? You wanna talk, Brian? <laughs> yeah. Um <laughs> I was just thinking about that question. That's funny. Uh, I, I think we had originally met because you needed uh, you needed seed from Bearbrook, and so that's mm -hmm. when we had brought the seed out. And you said, "Hey, come and take a look at some of these fields and and tell me what you think." And 
this was one of the first ones that we had seen. And so then that just started our our program with you and seeing how we could turn this around. Yeah, so Brian, walk through, because the next picture is going to be a couple of weeks later after we did our first app. You know, what, what do we do on this site from a cultural perspective, from a product perspective? Certainly, you know, you've got the grow in green uh, icon at the top of the grow in, but what, what, what else went in to try to give us a shot at, at having success? Um, well, Christy could probably say a little bit more about the cultural practices that she did. I mean, did you went through and aerated the whole thing and got up as much of the debris and rocks and asphalt and brick and all of that out of there and then mm -hmm. dressed it with sand, right? Correct. And we did deep tining, we sliced, we rolled the field, we did top dress with 100 tons of sand, 50 in the beginning of the process and then 50 at the end. Uh, mm -hmm. We were slicing and deep tining because that all of that rock and construction degree, debris over one year of freeze thaw was at the surface of the the playing field. So we were yeah. concerned with the safety, and that's why this process was extended a little longer because it, it took us a couple of weeks to pick up all the rock and to feel a lot more comfortable with the conditions. So yeah. at that point, after all that material was taken out and then uh, put down. Baron Brooks, HGT, and RPR, and then right. uh, we, we started the the growing program from there. Yeah. yeah, really, really looking at and taking soil samples and looking at what your mineral balance was. You know, amending with grain and fertilizers were necessary as well. Um, yeah, I had forgotten to ask this, um, Christy. How many times did you mow in 2016 while you were going through this establishment with all this stuff going on with that soil? Four times. So okay. from May of 2016, they hydro seeded the park. Um, the only thing that was really growing out there for the first couple of months was a variety of turf weeds. It was kind of like a test plot. Yeah. Um, the contractor came back in and hand picked every weed on the athletic field, which I think is kind of what helped us along this year with the weed control. Um, and then we put down a bunch of different, we top dressed it, we put fertilizers down, we did gypsum, we just couldn't get anything to grow here. Right, right. So then, so now fast forward back to 2017, week 13, week one, this is June 13th, this is uh, the start of it, the first application. I've got a picture here now, this is five weeks, uh, four weeks later, week, week number five here. So this is four weeks later in June, uh, or rather it'd be July 17th, so that's a typo there, I don't, don't mind that. but. What a difference, um, you know. I think we're we're probably on the right track here. I mean, you can still see it's you know it's got some clover, and I still think we're still building density. But that's an that's a pretty impressive turnaround, wouldn't you say? Absolutely, we were really impressed with what we were seeing so quickly. We kind of we kind of stuck with it, and Brian was working pretty closely, and you know we we went ahead and did a few more apps, but you know, just give a peep, just give people an idea of what you're working with. You know why? Why won't standard stuff work on this property here? I mean, take take a look at this. I mean, it, um, the parameters healthy soil need not apply here. I mean, this is it, it. Almost looks like concrete. Um, I mean, I was amazed by that picture. Were you digging out a goalpost there? Is that why that is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, pretty amazing. But even so, this is a couple of weeks after we started this program with Grow In. And you can see, uh, if you look at the top of the picture, there are some roots that are that are penetrating that um, that mess there up in uh, up in the top of the picture. So we're we're getting this root penetration, but we're really having to work for it. And um, you know, I always tell people, grow in is kind of like a catalyst almost. It um, you you balance the soil with the minerals. You've done your cultural practices. You know, grow in is that tool that's going to really get that turf uh, get that turf going. Um, let's look at some other pictures here. Um, now we're into week eight here, August 11th. Um, it wasn't all sunshine and, and roses, though. I mean, can you share with me as we're going through this? I think we probably even had some rust pop up at some point in time, right? Um, we we did. We it was kind of we were seeing progress, but 
we just kept having a bunch of different hurdles. So we were experiencing issues with the irrigation at some times because obviously the previous slide shows how much clay and um, the the grounds are. And so we were, this is a new property to us. So we're trying to learn what what it needs and what's going to help it grow. So at right. one point we were irrigating it too much, then we weren't irrigating it enough, um, then the rust came, then we were just kind of putting everything we could out there and we were still not seeing a lot of growth. Um, and then I think right around this time where this picture is, is when it just started to pop and all of the um, the grass was starting to grow. Um, yeah. that you can actually see on that August 11th we had sliced again around that time. We were still yeah. trying to help penetrate that water and those nutrients down and after this picture on August 11th we were mowing twice a week because we couldn't keep up with the the growth yeah yeah and I, I think we've got a picture here week nine and this is probably the last picture that I think I have up on yeah. the presentation that, that uh, was the best that it looked yeah yeah I mean Brian what what can you say about the whole project start to finish um, I know that Christy you've been you were pretty pleased with what the team was able to accomplish. I mean, your guys' thoughts as we close here and move on to some other pictures. Um, what do you guys think? I think overall, I mean, it was it was for my end. I don't know about Christy because I mean, she had to <laughs> she had to live this more than I did. But it was great, <laughs> great taking this this park from what it was with all the you know concrete and asphalt and you know, I mean, the soil profile was just horrendous, and you'd look at that and think it was a complete lost cause to try and get anything to grow there. And then, you know, look at August 15th. I mean, when yeah. when I took that picture, it was like, all right, you know, we, we did it. And it, it was a learning process. And, I mean, it was, yeah, we, we have this program, but it was just, it was more than that. You know, like you had said, with the irrigation and trying to get everything dialed in and the all the rain we got, the drought that we were in, you know, every, everything. And so it was, it, it was, it was a great experience. Yeah. Yeah. I know it was. I, I definitely agree. Yeah. Christy, you know, just your, your thoughts, I mean, closing on it. I mean, I think that, um, I think we learned a lot, but what, you, what's your thoughts closing on it? What are you, what are you going to do moving forward now? Well, my thoughts are I am super glad I don't have another field that is similar to this because <laughs> yeah. this took off some years of my life in this process, but it ended really well. The affiliates were shocked that we were able to turn this field around. They started to move around their schedule because they didn't think that we would be up and running for their fall football season. And wow. currently right now we are doing this a program the grow in similar to this at three of our parks because we are so happy with the results and we look to continue using this program in the future. That's great. Well, I certainly appreciate your time today, and I, I know that you know you probably stick on this this uh, webinar here, and so if there's questions for Christy, hopefully she can stay and and we can hit them on the back end. But really appreciate absolutely. Your time. No problem. Uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, we did some other stuff up there in Chicago as well, um, just some before and afters for you guys to look at. This was um, Lake Forest, and guys, we went through a pretty bad drought up there in the in the um, fall, and we had something like, I can't remember how many weeks in a row there wasn't a drop of rain, so we had a lot of fields kind of looking like this, and it's not optimal to have weak turf running in the fall and winter because then you're going to look at a, a really tough establishment period in the spring. So we did some trials with Grow In. Um, and uh, and 16, 20, 12 with our ornament sprayed onto the granular. So that's a that's a that's a granular product there, and overseeding with a 50, 50 barren brug. Um, so you know this 28, and now this is what it looks like a month later uh, with that 16, 20, 12 and grow in and uh, with a barren brug 50, 50. Um, this was Lake Forest. Uh, we also did it at Arlington Heights up there again on the same day, so September 28th and October 26th is before and after. Um, you know, again, just you're looking at a lot of play on these fields, um, and you're looking at at really uh, a weak turf. And um, you can actually see the LT rich if you look real close uh, going out there. Uh, this was all applied with an LT rich. And um, Greg, you actually did some application on this. Um, if you want to turn your volume on. 
you know, when we, when we got out there, it was uh, incredibly dry. It was really thin. And we went, part of the story is when we got there, they were only watering about 17 minutes the zone. So that was pretty pretty low. But once we got one rainfall, that turned it around and nothing went on. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, we have some more pictures too uh, here. Um, yeah, we also did some pictures. We also did some pictures um, here in front of the um, goalpost. Here you can see certainly um, you've got some uh, some play there. Uh, doesn't look like they shifted the goalposts uh, as much as maybe they should have. We've got to try to grow that in. You can kind of see uh, filling it in. Getting it, try to try to getting it in before uh, we go into uh, the winter here. So uh, that was the uh, that was that. Another big one we had at Mission Walker High School. Um, applicator did this. Had been hydro seeding for decades and said I've I've never seen anything like this before. Um, this was week two. They were eleven the field. They did a Spartan sand cap on this. So they put a, an inch or two of sand on top of the field. This was a clay clay soil, not optimal. So they just put sand on top of it, uh, graded it. And then seeded right into the sand, and they're they're really kind of growing it like hydroponics, where the roots are, are primarily hanging out in the sand, but you know maybe penetrating a little bit into the parent soil. So this was week two, and now this was week six. So four weeks later, and uh, they're hitting this with healthy grow 1032 at a pound of nitrogen a week, and doing a foliar pack grow in at nine ounces a thousand a week. So their big thing was they need to be ready to go by August to have this thing played on. This was an 80/20 uh, blue rye mix. Um, and, uh, you know, they wanted to have this thing ready by August. Um, you know, again, some more week six pictures there. Um, now week seven, you can see in just a week later, you know, what difference a day makes. Um, you know, I was out there on the field. It was, it was pretty impressive, really. Um, this has historically been a really horrible field uh, for Mishawaka. I think about a couple weeks in the season, they have one of their rains, and it turns into a big mud pit, and then it turns into a dust bowl on the back end. So uh, school was super pleased. Uh, they had the right people in the right right place that was able to step in and convince them not to go artificial, to leave it natural, that they could do it. And uh, that's exactly what they did. So landscape turf now. Um, again, any questions on the sports turf side uh, will be here. Uh, landscape turf, we're going to shift gears, and we're going to get in with Dave Waller and uh, Jeff Brooks uh, out there in Pennsylvania. You'll hear about Armin Concentrate, which is our amino acid polymer uh, and increases nutrient uptake in the soil. Uh, we put it on mineral fertilizer. Uh, it's going to be available on Healthy Grow this year, and uh, there'll be another uh, product will be available on a granular product, uh, and hopefully we'll have some news on that after the first of the year. Um, Microsync, you'll hear about that as well. That's our chelated micronutrient package uh, with amino acids. And we're really trying to increase chlorophyll production and rooting with this, better color, uh, better, better color and overall health. And it's compatible with pesticides. That was a big deal, especially low volume applications out there in the landscape. Uh, we wanted this fully compatible with anything from glyphosate all the way to uh, fungicides, insecticides, you name it. Um, and PB1 LTO, you hear about that. This is a biological based package with molasses and seaweed and amino acids and humic and armin and, and bacteria and everything that comes into that. So you'll see the use too with that later on after this second case study. So again, better color overall health. We're trying to get the chlorophyll going, get the rooting going, provide better color and health. Uh, Dave and Jeff, uh, you guys are up now. Um, looks like Dave's unmuted himself. Dave, you want to say hello? How you doing? Doing well. Thanks for thanks for being on the call today. Um, really appreciate it. Dave, you want to do you want to tell your story a little bit about who you are and, and who Warrior Landscape is before we get into the particular case study? Sure. Um, I, I started a landscape business a lot like most other landscape contractors, just by cutting grass. I was in high school, um, just started hanging signs up in my neighborhood for extra money. And by the time I graduated high school, I was cutting like maybe 30 yards a week. I decided mm -hmm. to go to um, I cut. You know, I still cut all the time while I was still in, in state college. So it was, I live in the South Hills of Pittsburgh. I'm seven miles south of Pittsburgh, and um, I would drive 143 miles every one way, every weekend from the end of August to Thanksgiving and cut 30 yards, 30, 35 yards every weekend, drive back home Sunday night. And I did that for three and a half years until I graduated. I graduated in 2004. I have a degree in landscape contracting. Uh, my 
my major emphasis was in design, design build. In 2005, I started my business. Um, you know, so I've, I've been doing it ever since. Each year, it's gotten progressively bigger. Um, I'm up to 12 employees. I have 10 trucks. We have uh, pneumatic blower trucks. We do a lot of maintenance. Like the third of my business is just maintenance, where we do uh, we mow about 75 residential lawns. We do 10 HOA communities. We do a shopping mall. We do a 58-acre sports complex, a 36-acre convent, and three churches. And then I fertilize roughly three million square feet every six weeks. Wow, that's a my business. Um, the rest of my business, the other third is we do a lot of hydro seeding, we do a lot of mulch blowing, and then uh, the other portion of my business is doing just landscape. We implement a lot of landscape installations, whether it's a residential setting, a commercial setting. We do a lot of things with boulders, a lot of sure. big trees. So I'm busy yeah. year-round. Plow snow, um, it's hard for me to really do anything other than this business. I feel like I'm married to it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, in talking with you, Dave, you know, your maintenance business ends up leading possibly to, you know, other, other contracting business, but it's also a way for you to play defense against, you know, other companies that might want to try to establish a relationship with your customer, right? Exactly. And that's part of the reason why I got into fertilizing. When I originally started this business, I, I, I really didn't know much about fertilizing other than, you know, your basic Scott's application. But as sure. I've grown and got into, like, more of a commercial setting, I've realized by just, going to different meetings, different HOA meetings, different bid meetings that typically whatever person or entity that you're working for, they typically want to use one contractor for the majority of their services. Mm -hmm. So that's when I got licensed through the state. I became a licensed applicator. I learned a lot about different types of fertilizer. So, like, if I just fertilized or if I just cut grass, I mean, I obviously wouldn't be making a living, but by, do, by me offering several different services, Collectively, it works within my business, and fertilizing is one portion of that. It's not the biggest portion of my business, but like when my commercial work, my HOA communities, my commercial like uh, the sports complex I do, they don't want to deal with multiple people. They don't want to deal with someone subbing it out. They don't want to go into the aggravation of oh, we're here to cut the grass, and someone was there fertilizing it yesterday. So I'm able to schedule that and work that and basically make it as easy as possible for the customer that I'm working for to be as pain free. Yeah. Yeah, well, you also want to make it as easy as you can for yourself, too, when you're doing these, these applications, and you want to make sure they work, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, so, when, as I understand it, when you started, you were doing all granular apps. I was. And, when I first started doing this, um, I, I was just, I was running just the old Lesco five-step application, and sure. the biggest problem I ran into was broadleaf weed control because I was using a dry product. Um, mm -hmm. I was sometimes at 4.30 in the morning just to try to catch, like, a dew. But, you know, as my square footage increased, like, it, it just wasn't feasible. So I did that for a couple years, and I, um, about six or seven years ago, I bought a 300-gallon tank saver, uh, space saver tank for a pickup truck. And that kind of brought a little bit because now I was able to spray, um, you know, broadly weed control, I was able to spray uh, pre-emergent for my crabgrass, and it, and it, gave me more leeway because now I had more time. I wasn't in that sense of rushing. But right. with fertilizing, I mean, there was, there's was there been a lot of, you know, trial and error and a lot of different things that you, you, you realize that, like, what basically it comes down to is, like, every year is different. There's some yeah. years where you have a lot of humid, humidity, a lot of hot temperatures. There's going to be other years where it's going to be very wet. So there's there's things that you need to alter. So when I first started doing that granular application, I mean, there was a lot of different things that I, you know, I, until um, I've really kind of progressed this system and, and I've done a lot of trial and error just with Jeff because I can't, like, throughout the season, I talk to Jeff all the time on the phone. We're constantly trying different things. We're trying different rates. And it's just by doing trial and error and tweaking things that I feel like we're able to perfect, you know, perfect this a lot better. And, and in the sure. bottom line, I'm, I'm, you know, providing a better service and using less chemical. Well, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what it's all about is, is how can you how can you run a profitable program that's going to be, you know, easier for you to put out and that's going to provide better service. And so when you started this liquid program where you switched your first two spring apps to liquid, you know, you were using a more, you know, traditional 2204 liquid fertilizer and maybe some other liquid stuff. And, you know, I think that gathering around with Jeff, uh, you know, you saw where it could get better, right? Exactly. 
there was a there was a uh, a three year period that I was using whole organics, and mm-hmm. I was a liquid form of that, and I had a three hundred gallon tank um, it, it my where my business is in my in my building here, and I kept it refrigerated. We the, the, the downside with that was is like that that sounded in theory like a great product because I was a it was allowing me to use like my dimension my predominant like at a cut rate so I was sure. applying that ounce and a half per gallon and when I was using whole organics I was able to apply it or at least theoretically put it down at 0.75 ounces per gallon and sure. what I noticed was is I wasn't getting the longevity with the with the crabgrass control with the weed control because I was using it at a cut rate and it almost right. to the if I was going to, I would have to increase it back to the ounce and a half. And it was like, well, I'm, I'm spending a ton of money with this whole organics and I'm really not seeing the, the benefit from it, especially from a cost standpoint, because I was, you know, there was a lot of times where I was just maybe breaking even and it was, it was difficult right. to do. So that was when right. I, we, I talked with Jeff and we decided to switch this over into kind of more of a hybrid program where right. I, I'm, I'm now using this micro sink. I'm using the armament concentrate. I'm spraying my first two applications are liquid, and I and I kind of, my first two applications are pretty much the same. We're using we're doing a split rate or a split application of the weed control of the uh, crabgrass control. We're using mm-hmm. the a 4600 fertilizer, an 0062. So like I have a 750 gallon tank, and I'm spraying approximately 500 thousand square feet out of it. So. Right. By me doing that and then switching over to a dry grub control, a dry uh, summer fur, a dry winterizer, and then just kind of spot treating as needed, I've right. noticed it's been much more resilient. Like in the turf, there's been less stress. If there is stress, it's bouncing back. Um, it's recovering. Like this year, for example, in Pittsburgh, it was pretty hot and it was pretty wet. So mm-hmm. there, was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of fungus problems. And when I, when you were, when the previous speaker was talking about that situation in that Prospect Park, um, I had a, a homeowner that's very particular about his grass, and Jeff introduced me to that growing product, and we actually used it there, and it reminded me of that because it was like, it took, it took me a six-week period, but it was night and day, and right. it was, it, it just worked great. And like this year, like I feel like by doing this, like I. I you know, I just feel like this has really increased the uh, overall visibility of, of the turf and hopefully overall the, the overall health of it. Well, and I, I think, you know, to me, and, and again, we're not trying to say that other programs are good, bad, or indifferent, but I think for me, you know, going through this and telling your story, you know, you've come full circle now to where you're, you're using a stabilized urea and potassium chloride, which at this point in time, potassium is really price effective. And then you're mixing in with our, our key concentrated technologies of, of microsync and armament concentrate and you're, you're getting great results, you know, at a good price. Um, you know, I think that that's the whole thing when it comes down to lawn care is that even though we've inserted some technologies in here, it, it's still been at, at, at a level to where it's, it's affordable, it's allowed you to see those results and it's allowed you to find success and, and, and make a good margin on your business as well. Um, like that. that that picture actually that's online right there, that, that's one of the pictures of this 58-acre sports complex. And this place was neglected for years. And the man that, re, the man that purchased this, he purchased this in uh, October of 2013. And I got affiliated with this property in March of 2014. And what you're looking at right there is a seven-and-a-half-acre miniature golf course. And the rest of this property, this man has put over $40 million into this property. Wow. And there's practice putting greens, there's this miniature golf course, there's an artificial 400-yard driving range, and it's surrounded by regular turf. And then there's a building up here that's uh, 500,000 square feet that ha- actually has an indoor FIFA-regulated soccer field built in t- inside of it. Wow. So there was an absorbent amount of construction that was going on on this property. I mean, they moved 500,000 cubic ton of dirt and then they dropped a mountain 32 feet to make this area level. So to see that picture now, like, because I have actually pictures of what this looked like prior to this, I mean, it's night and day. And I was fortunate enough that the man that actually owns this property, um, you know, he's he's a really big golf guy, and I think that that was part of the reason why he bought this property is just because he enjoys it. But, like, I was fortunate enough to work with somebody that really didn't skimp on a budget. 
and I, and I was able to, you know, he, he basically trusted me, and I was able to enable him in, the, in incorporating different programs into this because on an average weekend, there's about 5,000 people that come to this facility. Wow. And there are everywhere. So we're, we, 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 we cut the grass there, too. So when we cut it, we usually get there like 7.30 in the morning or so because the driving range opens at 9.30, and we start cutting where the range is. And then by 10 o'clock in the summer, there's people playing miniature golf. So, like, we're constantly battling, like, where people are in because it's so busy. But, like, just the construction with the compaction and, like, the dozers, the excavators, everything was there to, like, basically air – like, because we did a lot, of, a lot of aeration, a lot of overseeding. I had two new manure trucks. We did a ton of like top dressing with mushroom manure just to get an organic base in. So I mean, there's been a lot of a lot of money and time invested into this, and it it looks great. I mean, just just from a personal standpoint, like there's a lot of times that I just go out and do estimates for just you know different jobs, landscape installs, and people that you know people be like, oh, what's some of the jobs that you've done? And I always just say, this place is called Cool Springs. And I say, oh, I've done all the landscaping at Cool Springs, and people are like, oh, you did all that? I'm like, wow, that's like such a big job. So right. there's a lot of pride right. in doing. It. I think a lot of a lot of that help has just been that that program that we were able to implement just with the turf. Yeah, yeah, a- absolutely. And I think to me, you know. We, we were able to come together and work together to allow you to reach your goals. And I, I think there's probably people sitting out there in the audience that, you know, are probably in your shoes, Dave. You know, they're probably running an all granular program and probably, you know, hearing some of the issues that you were having. And, you know, I think that to me, the message I'd like to get out to them is that, you know, you don't have to switch from granular to liquid. I mean, you can run a hybrid program and, and then what you've done still be at price competitive, you're not blowing off fertilizer like you like you used to in the sidewalks, things like that. You're getting better, you know, coverage with your with your pre emergence and things like that in the beginning. Um, you know, that's really um, if you got people sitting in the audience in your shoes, that's that's a take home message. Am I am I right? Exactly. I mean I I mean it's like anything else, especially in, in the on my end of this where you're you're basically doing this for a living. I mean people they, sometimes I've noticed people younger that just starting into this business that like they think for a second like they think that like you know they got to invest all this money and all buy all this equipment and all this you know all these trucks and everything and then the next thing you know they're they're out of business because they've right. completely gone over but you know when it comes to this I, even if you just if you just bought like a 300 gallon tank sprayer like I did when I first started doing this and that would be all that you would need I mean even if you had the ref- you're on a big property. It's still well worth it because you're going to get you're going to get the results. The hardest portion of this is the dead of summer, like from after the fourth of July to like mid August. That's the most detrimental time because that's when the grass is stressed. You know, people don't Absolutely. people don't irrigate it. I mean, so by putting that nutrient in and having a nice recover in the fall, that's where you're really going to see the benefit. Yeah, no doubt. Well, I appreciate you sharing your story there, Dave, and I'm sure. You'll probably stick on to the end. So if anyone's got any questions for Dave, um, you know, hopefully you'll be able to stick on. And just really appreciate your time today. Oh, no problem. Thanks for having me. Um, there's some other pictures that we've got around. Um, in earnest of time, in fairness of time here, this was a two app of organic fertilizer, three quarters of a pound of N, with just armament concentrate, where you applied 50 ounces per acre. And that's usually what we like to see an entire season. But this particular applicator wanted to put it down all in one shot there in the spring. Um, and you can kind of see, it's kind of hard to see on this particular drone picture because it's darker. There's synthetic there on the left, and there's that organic environment there on the right. Uh, picture taken middle of May. And then again, here it is now in June 20th, and you can start to see a synthetic picture fall up quite a bit. So the organic fertilizer plus the armament there, uh, you can see it's still pretty green. And here's some other shots of it. Um, you know, this was no additional apps as their first two in the spring, and now we're in the July 2nd. Uh, you can just kind of see that line as you take it from the second floor here on July 13th. So exciting stuff. Um, this is also a customer in Elkhart. He did the PB1 LTL spray. So instead of microsync and R- and uh, Armit concentrate, he did the PB1 LTL spray at four ounces of a thousand pictures taken on uh, June 18th. And um, uh, he hadn't had a granular application in a long way. So this is one week after that spray. Uh, again, this is a pretty uh, shaded area here with the tree, the pin oak in the front yard. Um, customer says this is crazy. 
um, because this is uh, now on June 19th. So they did a 10-3-2 for, for diamine uh, with this PB1 LTO spray on April 16th, and now that's what it looks like on June 19th, even with all that shade. So certainly some opportunities. Um, IKEA, uh, this is one of our customers here in Indianapolis, IKEA grand opening. Uh, in six weeks, he grew this turf in, and IKEA said, we don't care what it costs, get it done. And um, they, uh, I hope everyone can see that. Um, in six weeks, this is what it, what it, what it is. Uh, he couldn't have done it with just granular. Um, and so he came to us and said, what do I do? And we said, you grow in. So he did healthy grow 1032 plus ammonium sulfate. And um, he did uh, grow in once a week. So. Moving on, landscape ornamentals. Um, you'll hear about Bio 1266, which is our uh, organic based NPK package. Uh, it's got micronutrients, excellent bio based nutrition, and chloroburst, which is your iron, manganese, zinc package for chlorotic ornamentals. And we'll show a little bit of those pictures. If you've got thin oaks, you've got rhododendrons, you've got azaleas, you've got whatever with uh, yellow leaves because your pH is too high, this is a tool for that. Um, Ken, Tomiko, Ken, are you there? Yes, I am. How are you today? I'm doing great. Appreciate you getting on the call here. Ken, tell your story and tell your background, and then we'll, we'll, we've got a couple pictures and sites that you've done. Well, I uh, started in the North Pittsburgh office of the Davy Tree Company. Uh, Scott Simpson uh, hired me there, and this was my first introduction to plant health care. Uh, the Davy Tree Company at the time was a very cover spray type of a company. And, you know, I was a little, a little uncomfortable with spraying all, you know, all day long and everything like that. Uh, I quit there, and I started at the Bartlett Tree Company uh, over here in Irwin, Pennsylvania. A guy named Steve Miller hired me there, and, you know, he really took me under his wing and really uh, showed me a lot, sent me to their, their school, their IPM school down in Charlotte, where Dr. Smiley and Dr. Frederick, uh, you know, gave great training. Uh, this is where... This is where I really learned that I loved plant health care. They do so much with the soil. It's more than just spraying some pesticides, and you really see results when I work there. Uh, a good friend of mine that I worked at Bartlett with, he quit uh, there and went down to Arborell Tree Service in Pittsburgh. Uh, Andrew called me about two weeks later and said, uh, this guy, Rob Krulljack, he uh, He's looking to start a plant health care company. And I gave him a call. And uh, in 2009, I uh, started there. And uh, me, Rob, and Tim Frank, uh, it was a great combination of, you know, good business and good plant health care. He had great customers. And we really grew that uh, division wonderfully. Uh, yeah. When I quit there in January 25th, we had about six to 700 active plant health care customers. Mm -hmm. uh, I started a lawn division there, and we were doing about a half million dollars a season just in plant health care. Uh, January 25th of this year, I uh, quit there and I started Tomiko Arbor Services. Uh, mm -hmm. With the help of a whole bunch of people, uh, it, it changed my life. Uh, wow. I should have done this years ago, but uh, I'm glad I did it, and uh, I have 426 active customers right today, and wow. uh, yeah, but uh, one of the things that I really want to get across is that I used Davy Arbor Green, I used the Bartlett Boost made specifically for Pittsburgh, and yeah. I have used your products. The 1266, the Chloroburst, and the Holganix PB1 LTO is one of the most magnificent products I've ever used in my life. Wow. Um, it's not a, one of those type of products that you put it in and you gradually will see results. I couldn't believe some of the things that I was doing, and it was just me putting it into the ground. This yeah. is uh, the, the park over in Murraysville, Mark Miller's property over in Venetia. I mean, these was instant. Two, three, four weeks later, you would start to see. And 
it's great. Uh, when I started to Mike Arbor Services, I, I really want to say a uh, special thanks to my wife and my three girls. Uh, they put up with me doing this. Absolutely. And yeah, it was, uh, it was one of those things that it was very scary. I was scared. And uh, there are a couple people I'd really like to mention real quickly. Uh, Steve Miller from Bartlett Tree, Scott Simpson from Davy Tree, Rob Kroljack and Tim Frank from Arborell Tree, Sean Burnick, Stephen Carbonara, Shannon Herbs, and Greg Suber from the Rainbow Tree Company. Uh, Mark McKenzie, the Carroza Brothers, Ryan Kroljack, Kroljack Tree Service, and Beaver Jack Tree Service, and Tony from Debug. These guys get me a lot of work, and uh, the one guy that I want to take a, I saved them for last, was Todd Smith and Mark Seibart from your company. These two guys are detailed oriented. They will take my phone calls 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night for questions. It doesn't matter what time, whatever. They are there for technical support, which I, Todd worked at uh, John Deere. And at the time, John Deere sold you a product, but there was no technical support at all with it. Todd and Mark, it, it was amazing. And I, was, I had a trained set of products that I used, and I, this is what I used. They really educated me, and yeah. you can see the results. Uh, well, and, it's amazing. This is a game-changing product here. Well, I think, and, and while you're talking, we flipped through some of your pictures of, of turning around a parodic pin oak there on campus, of Packy Sandra that looked, you know, really on death's door that you're able to turn around. And you're now on your own. You've got your own company. You've got your family depending yep. on you. You know, it's all about results. And yeah. you know, now this this final project that I have up for you is about you know red maples, and you know they've been particularly hard to turn around. Anybody who knows red maples knows that they're they're really hard to turn around. And you had treated this row of them, but you left this one uh, in the beginning of the picture untreated. Um, you know what can you tell me about that project there and just that goodness. that was over at the Murraysville Park. Uh, the this whole product, uh, the whole place was they were ugly. They were all every year. Todd was telling me, he "Goes, I got to introduce you over there. Get you going on over there." And we went over there. I took some soil samples. You know, we went through with Mark and Todd, and we created this mixture of stuff that you know the what we were talking about the twelve six six bio, the chloroburst, and the whole organics. And we made a mixture, uh, and that's I did that in the fall, and that yeah. was the springtime pictures right there. Yeah. Wow. He's one of my first renewals. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I think your customers, again, it's, it's about results. And again, like you said, it, it's not necessarily incremental results. I mean, people that pay money for these services are not necessarily the most patient. So they, right. they, want, to see, they want to see it. And I think that with this program, this ultimate ornamental package that we put together, these three products, I think we were able to deliver on that. Um, can't thank you enough for signing on, Ken, and being a part hey, of this. Hey, thank you for allowing me uh, to do this. This was I was very nervous when I got on this, uh, but I just want to tell you, you have a great company and uh, great people and a great technical staff, and I yeah. really do appreciate that. Wouldn't, wouldn't be able to happen without you out there, Ken. You know, supporting us as well. So Ken's going to stick on. We just got really a couple more minutes, and just I'll flip through a few more metal pictures too to give people an idea. This was up in northern Indiana. They do a lot of hanging baskets. As you can see, they were running the ultimate ornamental package. Um, you know, here's a fall cleanup, and uh, they went ahead and showed me uh, the roots of what you're seeing here. So uh, you can just see what's going on and how we're able to do what we're able to do with this program and how it works. A tremendous amount of root growth leads to a tremendous amount of flower growth and, uh, and chlorophyll production. Um, the only difference here was PB1 LTO, triple 20 for both. Um, you know, that's, that's astounding. Um, that's stuff that's going to get you more business, you know, at the end of the day. Um, you know, here's one with uh, triple 28 pounds versus growing now. So we've been growing just a single product rather than three products, uh, two gallons per 100 gallons. So you just see 
uh, the opportunities here. This was a, a Side by side, one side of the sidewalk was treated with a standard program, the other side was treated with this program. We've been talking about the Alpha Environmental Package. You can see the progression through the weeks here. This was six total apps on the standard side and four apps with the uh, with the, with our products. Uh, the wife begged them after a while to treat both sides because you can see the difference here. Um, pretty amazing. Again, here it is on on August 9th. These things are looking pretty great. So. Uh, core burst on pin oaks. This was side by side, um, 10 ounces per inch diameter. It's on the label. Again, you can see here uh, one was treated, one was not, and uh, you know it makes a big difference. So uh, these are the package and programs. These are available either online or through the advanced turf reps or any of our other distributor reps. Uh, Foliar pack on its own or PB1 with core burst liquid and uh, bio 1266. Landscape turf package that Dave Waller talked about was a stabilized urea. Uh, Microsync garment concentrate with low potassium chloride is an option. Uh, you could throw some PB1 LTO in um, on the back end of the season where you get stressful or, or to replace Microsync and garment concentrate. Uh, mix it in with granular fert later on in the season. And then the ultimate sports turf package is grow in uh, with some mineral fert or some healthy grow. So that's it. Um, always amazing how fast an hour goes. Appreciate everyone that was on this today, certainly the presenters that were on it as well. Um, can't thank everyone enough for making this happen. Uh, questions, comments? Yeah, uh, we'll try to squeeze a couple in here. Um, can you burn tender ornamentals with these products, especially chloroburst and PV1? Yeah, so you know, with turf, we, we usually look at going over the top and doing liquid application. With, with ornamentals, my rule, uh, and I'm certified arborist as well. My rule is that we really want to get this into the soil. So if you're going over the top, you're spraying over the top. You know, some you know, if you think you're going to do a low volume or whatever you're going to do, you want to wash it off after you've done it because these technologies and these products are meant to go into the soil. Um, it, could you burn tender ornamentals? Absolutely. I mean, it's in the summer and you're and you're sunning all that. It, will it mean that you're going to? Not necessarily. But my rule of thumb is get these into the soil. That's where they're going to work. All right. And what rate of 162812 was applied? Uh, 162812, we're usually going out at 150 to 200 pounds an acre. So okay. somewhere right in there. And how was the growing applied to the sports field? Growing was applied via LT Rich. Um, you're talking about probably half gallon. Uh, for a thousand, a uh, third of a gallon for a thousand, um, a Z spray uh, unit for the LT Rich, uh, your standard Z spray unit. So growing can go out with low volume applications. Um, get if you if you're interested in it, get with your your uh, LT Rich represented because um, it's optimal to change out the nozzles when you do that. Just make sure your flow is right. But um, we all the pictures you've seen growing, they're all through low volume application uh, Z spray units. All right. Uh, that's about it. Anyone else who has questions, when, when I send out this link, uh, look for an email from Lana Landscape, and when we send out the link, we can put some contact info in there for anyone who had questions. Um, other than that, George, I really appreciate your time. All the panelists, thank you for presenting and everyone for attending. Uh, again, keep an eye out for the email next week with the link. Great. Thanks have, a lot, everybody. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.